Hello, everybody, and welcome to Lighting Design Lab's introduction to Power Over Ethernet. Uh, this is John Wilson from the Lighting Design Lab. I'm joined by Armando Berdiel. We are going to wait just a little bit longer before we get started, but uh, wanted to give a special shout out and thank you to all you early arrivers. We appreciate you being punctual. Always better to start a webinar a minute early than a couple minutes late. That way you can get it pulled up on your favorite screen. You can get the volume dialed in and you can sneak off to get your coffee. Head out to the lobby maybe. Some of you who are viewing this on the big screen, get some treats. Maybe a little early for treats, I don't know. We had 57 people register for this webinar, which we're excited about. It's a pretty hot topic. And we are thrilled that all of you could join us. It's the top of the hour, but we're just going to give it maybe one more minute before we kick things off here. So thank you very much for hanging on while we let the slightly less punctual crowd join. Oh yeah, the numbers are ticking up. And just because I see lots of names still just actively piling in, we're going to give it just a little bit more time. This is kind of like uh, seating at the gorge, you know, the, the punctual crowd gets right down there. They get this, the sweet seats, the zoo concert style. They're right up front and center, but we're still letting people pile in the back boy how good does the zoo concert sound right now man oh man hopefully 2021 we get back there okay feels like i'm watching a stock take off the attendees just keep climbing up but it's 10.02, and so I think we got to get going here. So uh, for those of you who heard the original salutation, bear with me. Thank you, everybody, very much for joining us. Welcome to the introduction to Power Over Ethernet. Uh, most of you are familiar by now, 2020. We all know the drill. Um, we're going to keep you all muted for most of this webinar. There might be a time at the end when we can open it up to questions. Uh, but what we want to do is encourage you to use the chat feature to submit questions to LDL staff. We'll pause throughout this presentation to address those questions that you send in to us. So please feel free to use that chat box. And throughout the webinar today, there's going to be a couple online polls, and we encourage you to participate in those. Following the webinar, there's going to be a really short survey. That's just a great way for us to get feedback, and then we don't have to send you additional emails. And if you have any questions, you know, about what's going on, we always encourage people, feel free to reach out to us. Our email is right there. Want to remind people this webinar today is brought to you by Seattle City Light. Lighting Design Lab is a part of Seattle City Light, and uh, we're grateful for you know the the city and the utility empowering us to do the great work that we do. Of course, we don't do it on our own. It takes a village. Uh, that is reflected by the audience group that we have here. Looking through the participants on the webinar today, I see representation from all of these circles right here. 
And this is really the best way to get it done. There, there are times it makes sense to have a conversation directly with end use customers or directly with trade allies, but the learning process, you know, it's like a force multiplication. When you get everybody together and they can share their experiences, um, the webinar series brings us all together. Still isn't quite like the classroom, but uh, we appreciate having y'all here. Next slide, please. And of course, just to remind you what we do here at the Lighting Design Lab, it's not just the education and the training. We take the feedback from you all. We listen to what's going on. We try and keep our finger on the pulse and we're developing tools and resources for the market, trying to educate end use customers as well as support trade allies, design allies. It takes a lot of work to get it done. And you folks certainly are critical to that. And uh, you guys know what it's all about. So I think without further ado, I'm gonna pass it to our instructor today, Mr. Armando Berdiel. And Armando, I'll let you introduce yourself. I was on mute there. Awesome, thank you very much, John. And thank you for the uh, introduction and, and commentary. Uh, again, my name is Armando Berdiel. I am the uh, Technical Development Supervisor at Lighting Design Lab. Uh, I have a nice background in uh, computer science and business with some engineering management. I uh, had a big interest in connected devices from early on, uh, expanded that interest uh, with a lot of work with the uh, network lighting control environment in uh, Lutron Electronics, then perfected that uh, knowledge with uh, wearing every single hat in a uh, retrofit channel partner that serviced the entire Northeast markets. Uh, think, you know, New York, New Jersey, uh, Boston, New Hampshire, um, and doing everything from lighting audits to technical sales to uh, commissioning and all this good stuff. Um, but enough about me wanted to learn a little bit about more about who is with us here today. So I'm gonna launch the first poll that we have, just which best describes you. So, you know, just, hey, getting started in the morning. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, wanted to get some participation uh, in here early, get us, get us used to, to uh, engaging with each other. Uh, thank you for all those that are already voting. Uh, I'm gonna close in about three to five more seconds. Thank you again for the participation. I'm seeing already a nice even uh, spread in the audience. All right, thanks again for all that voted. I'm gonna close and share with us. All right, so again, thanks a lot. Pretty even spread for, for the audience that we have here today. So without further ado, let's get uh, started. Uh, you're gonna have to forget my, my uh, terrible jokes. Uh, I love uh, Halloween, we're in October. I'm thinking power over ethernet, PoE, Poe, Edgar Allan Poe. So we're, you'll see a little bit of that Poe imagery in my transition slides. But I uh, wanted to set the stage for us a little bit. What, what are we here, what are we doing here talking about a power over ethernet? Ultimately, what we're talking about is a cable, a standard, a communication protocol that does two main functions. The PoE standard delivers both power and data, different from our traditional AC or line voltage, uh, which only delivers power. And as you see at the bottom uh, right over here, in order to, to, to have connected lighting devices, you need to have that additional uh, connected piece to your equipment. And we're gonna be talking about all about what the difference is between PoE and line voltage. Uh, important to also note is this big difference between uh, alternating current and direct current. Uh, not gonna go into the electrical engineering life of it all, but we use different currents when we're powering devices. Uh, in the utility world, we traditionally use your alternating current. That's when you hear your 120 volts or you know, in, in Europe, your 230 volts. Uh, however, your new lighting uh, sources, LEDs, do not use this alternating current. You only, they use this direct current, a lo lower voltage. And when we're converting you know, current from, from line voltage, uh, from alternating current to DC, uh, there, there's some 
energy loss there. There's some efficiency that is lost there and that conversion and not, you know, and, and we're not having systems that are the most efficient in this matter. Uh, we're gonna be talking about, you know, the, the, the thought of, of a new paradigm where, you know, we're gonna be able to power our lighting and connect devices, our IP-based devices, not with the utility delivered um, alternating current all the time, but we'll be able to be to harness direct current directly and not be able to, con to to have that energy loss when you're converting from AC to DC. So that's another interesting thing to, to be thinking about when we're talking about power over Ethernet as well. And ultimately, one of my favorite things to say is like, hey, with power over Ethernet lighting, you're going to have power in the ceiling. You're going to have smart devices in the ceiling that communicate on the same network on the same platform, you know, it provides that infrastructure for the technologies of tomorrow, both within the building and beyond the building. Uh, one of my new favorite phrases that I that I uh, learned as, as uh, I've been delving into power over ethernet is IP conversions. And that is the idea that, you know, devices or, or systems that used to be in different types of network before are now converging on the same platform. You know, think about, uh, you know, phone, uh, your, your voice over IP, uh, music, video, TV, now lighting. Uh, again, we're seeing this IP convergence where all of these different types of systems, when, when they can connect in the same platform, a lot of operational efficiencies can be realized. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that connected lighting prospectus uh, and, and how power over Ethernet can help us get there. You know, uh, lighting or the LED technology has, has penetrated buildings at about 60% of, of building industry. Uh, and that's, that's a, uh, a statistic given to us by Goldman Sachs uh, this year, 2020. Uh, so pretty pretty mainstream already in, in our building infrastructure. And, and LEDs magazine had this question on, hey, uh, these not like these non-energy benefits, these benefits of connected lighting, you know, how much would people plan on using these as a secondary business opportunity? And we see from, from a poll that a, a, a good 70% of implementers uh, are, are very likely or somewhat likely considering you know, network lighting control, connected lighting uh, capabilities as is a strong secondary business opportunity. And, and we can tie that to how a building, uh, the building budget and the building uh, infrastructure is laid out. You, you may have heard about this uh, 1990 rule expressed differently in the past, but the way we talk about it is about 1% of the building's budget uh, Per, per square foot is spent on what we call energy and resources. These are, you know, your electricity, your water, waste, uh, lighting, cooling. So 1% of your building's budget per square foot is spent on these energy and resources. 9% of that budget is spent on the space and the layout, your overhead, your rent. But think about how efficient is each floor's uh, workflow, layout, the, the, the way people can walk through a building is that the most optimal uh, way that it could be? You know, are your are your brainstorming rooms being used? Your conference rooms being used? That's important things to know for, for a building. Excuse me. And ninety percent of that building budget um, per square foot is spent on what we call the wellness and productivity. That's the most impactful element that can be affected by by. Uh, smart building systems. That's all, you know, employee wellness, productivity that includes your acoustic and, and visual comfort, the, the thermal and indoor air quality, all of the, the building uh, amenities and uh, whatever can help improve employee health, comfort and work-life balance. Um, and often not necessarily thought about, but very prevalent is uh, revenue generating opportunities when you have these connected and smart devices in your infrastructure, you know, uh, these, these devices and sensors can deliver very granular device level data that can be aggregated and to have incredible value for, for be it the tenants or the business or the building owners to make educated decisions about how the building operations can improve going forward. 
Uh, however, you know, we have to be wary about what we consider this disconnect between, you know, uh, that conversation of, oh, you know, we don't necessarily need to, to increase upfront cost of a lighting project. You know, we're just looking to provide lighting in a space in a more flexible way. Uh, however, you know, this is when you when you're talking with uh, stakeholders or implementers that are very cost focused because uh, when we're talking to a lot of these building engineers architects designers specifiers uh you know can't remember that last time you didn't spec a, a connected uh, lighting system or a smart lighting system and now your facility professionals and building operators are getting savvier and 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 you know understanding that they need integrated and connected solutions uh, so we believe that through education and awareness, we can help catalyze and market transformation for these technologies. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about power over Ethernet lighting. Uh, we're looking to understand the, the, the system components and the architecture. Uh, I'm gonna, we're going to be reviewing the current state of the industry standards and the evolution of the POE industry. Um, we'll identify key benefits and applications for POE lighting and ultimately discern its role in the smart building ecosystem. Uh, good base introduction. Without further ado, let's get started in a couple of your basic terminology for power over Ethernet lighting. So I want to get started with a PSC, what we consider power source equipment. Uh, basically, we like the PSE devices are our power injectors. You know, injecting power uh, is 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 a terminology that we're using in PoE lighting, um, where we allow the single cable to provide both power and data to devices. Um, a PD is considered a power device in the power over Ethernet architecture. And that could be, you know, if we're discussing lighting, that could be a fixture, but it could also be any IP powered device. It could be, you know, a camera, a, a, a television screen that's the PoE powered. Uh, it could be an ancillary lighting device like a sensor or a wall station. Um, and it is important that we recognize the IEEE Institute of Electrical and electronics engineers, uh, standard 802.3. This is the POE standard, uh, where basically it talks about that connection between the PSC, the power sourcing equipment, and powered devices. The standard talks about the signal that allows the presence of a powered device to be detected by power source and allows that device and the power source to negotiate the amount of power required uh, as well as available by the PSC and required by the powered device. So that's really the power of the standard where the, these devices can, can negotiate how much power they're gonna use from the power sourcing equipment. Uh, then the evolution of the standards, you know, uh, you know, 802.3 XX and, and, the, and the iterations of these standards talk about the maximum amount of power that can be supplied. And we're gonna look at the standards evolutions in a little bit. Uh, and when we talk about, you know, a mid-span or, or end-span uh, PSC, an end-span PSC, uh, power sourcing equipment or device, is usually a network switch that can provide this uh, power over Ethernet power with, it, you know, following its standard on each, uh, on each port. Um, these end-span devices are usually um, implemented in new construction when, uh, in the sense that, um, buildings would may not have poe dedicated switches in their infrastructure and that just means that they're not providing power uh, a building may have switches network switches that that communicate this data but they don't provide this poe power and that's when you're going to need additional devices such as the mid-span power source equipment to inject power down the switches uh line and this is how this looks like, basically. So consider that you have, uh, let's start with a non-POE network switch, the, the bottom example here. So basically, this, this is a normal IT switch that provides you know, data across the devices connected to it, but not that power. You need another mid-span device, such as what you call a POE injector, to add that power. So with this combination of POE injector and the non 
PoE network switch, you can have this PoE connection. And this is what's called the mid-span device. Uh, on the contrary, a PoE splitter removes the data and power capabilities of that PoE cabling connection. Um, and let's talk a little bit about this cable, our Ethernet cable, or the RJ45 cable. Uh, RJ just stands for registered jack. And this 45 number, it just means that the number of, of the interface standard for this specific cable. Uh, so interesting to note, the Ethernet cable has eight wires that can be wired in a couple of different configurations, a T568A or B. Uh, and ultimately, these can be called patch or crossover wiring configurations. Uh, Ethernet cable, you'll, you'll also hear about the CAT5, CAT6, or better. You know, what's, what's the deal with all these uh, CATs? Uh, unfortunately, not our beautiful little furry friends, but uh, it stands for category. Uh, and the different categories of Ethernet cable uh, can provide different data transfer speeds. And you see CAT5 and the CAT, CAT6 uh, transfer speeds noted here. And after every category, as you can also see in the bottom on the top right, uh, each category has a, a significant data improvement uh, that it can communicate going forward. Um, so what's the deal with patch versus crossover cables? A patch or straight through cable often called, uh, yeah, straight through. Uh, and, and, and what it really means is uh, it doesn't change or, or swap any communication along the way. It's direct communication. The crossover, as the name implies, uh, changes the, the transmission and receiving cable or pins on this cable. Uh, so when do we want to use which? Uh, you want to use a, a crossover cable when you're connecting uh, two devices of the same type, like a PC to a PC, a switch to a switch, a fixture to a fixture. And you want to use this patch or straight through cable when you're connecting devices that are different. Uh, why is that? Uh, consider you know, two computers. Uh, the way they'll communicate is they're going to have their transmission ports and their receiving ports in the same way. So just like you don't want to have a connection from a PC to PC where in it's going to try to talk on the same cable, you know, it'll never be able like PC two would never be able to, to listen to PC one uh, if they were both talking at the same time through the same communication port. Uh, so that's why when you're connecting computers together with the same type of devices, you want to use a crossover cable that will ensure that, you know, if, if PC1 is communicating through a specific port, it'll cross over so to, to connect it to the receiving port of the other computer. Uh, a switch, for example, or a different type of device, you see a computer and we see a switch here, a different type of device will usually have the transmission and receiving ports in different locations so you can connect different devices with a patch or straight through cable. Um, same, same deal as if you're daisy chaining, uh, you know, wall stations or fixtures. If it's the same device, you want to more so use a crossover cable. And if it's a different device, you know, fixture to sensor or fixture to wall station, you can use a patch or straight through cable. A uh, tiny bit more on, on cables. When it comes to PoE cables, uh, there's, there's, there's different flavors where you can have the, the, the four uh, stranded twisted wires or, or have more and they'll have different uh, sizes, obviously, and requirements. Uh, and, and you can compare you know, your PoE cables. Line voltage is still slightly thicker than, than PoE. And, and it'll have different implications when it comes to uh, the plenum and accessing the ceiling. Um, when you have a, a drop ceiling that's very easily accessible, you know, it's, it's the real limiting factor of what you can have there is, uh, you know, how many remote uh, devices, how many drivers can fit in the plenum and, and PoE, you can have plenum specific PoE cable. Um, but when it comes to, you know, hard ceilings, it's a little bit more challenging to, to access all of your PoE infrastructure, your, your, your fixtures, your devices, and your drivers. Um, 
And that becomes especially important because we want to recommend in POE lighting uh, and, and just to, to minimize energy loss, we stick to 50 meter cable runs. It could technically allow for, for 100 meter runs on Ethernet cable, but, but uh, at 50 meters, you, you start in my seeing your voltage drops and making your connections a bit more efficient. Uh, that becomes very important when you think about your networking infrastructure. You know, you're used to having your telecommunication equipment if what you call your, your IDF rooms or your intermediate distribution frames. These are equipment or electrical closets that will host, you know, all of your, your telephone connections, a lot of your IT infrastructure, your network switches and routers. Um, so, so again, your, your intermediate distribution frame rooms are, are where you have or you host the majority of your, of your switches with your PoE ports. And again, very important to understand the cable length uh, requirements of 50 meters uh, that will minimize your voltage drops. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, the architecture when we're talking, when, when we're looking at the full thing. You know, this is uh, an example architecture from the new LEDs uh, system, and we'll, we'll be getting into specific system examples in a little bit. But, uh, you know, you'll have your power sourcing equipment. Those are your, your POE network switches uh, and, and, you know, your, your typical uh, architecture or your typical switch will have 48 ports um, that you can access. You'll have your, your fixtures that can have, you know, be it an integral driver, you can have fixtures that may have remote drivers. Uh, and the idea is that you can connect your CAT5, your, your Ethernet PoE cable to directly to drivers. And there's gonna, and we'll show in a little bit different architecture types for PoE systems. But uh, then you can use low voltage or non PoE standard Ethernet cable to connect your ancillary devices or components as well. Um, when it comes to emergency lighting, uh, still following the 2014 NEC article 700, where we're looking to um, ensure that, that uh, lighting fixtures, you know, don't sacrifice that control flexibility when you have emergency power going into it. Uh, so you know, we again derive by the same standards as, as traditional lighting, where normal and the emergency lighting should behave the same. It should dim up and down uh, if they're in the same zone. It's, if it should uh, operate together with normal power, but when emergency power or when there is a loss of normal power and emergency kicks in, your, P your emergency lights are to go to full bright. You know, so the standard stays true and it does not change. Uh, a good improvement or key benefit that PoE lighting can provide is the use of uh, uh, UPSs or their interrupt, uh, uninterrupted power supply, excuse me. Uh, these devices can live in your, in your IDF rooms and your main rooms with all your telecom equipment and you can tie your UPS devices to your switch racks. Uh, they're in obviously the, the emergency lighting designated switch racks uh, and not having to, to implement or install your, your batteries in the ceiling with PoE uh, devices. Um, also important to note, a couple of different PoE lighting manufacturers are developing their own flavors of UL 924 devices and nodes that are uh, connected into their systems. And we're going to actually dive into the node a little bit deeper in a little bit. With some of those things of the architecture, the technicality terms in mind, let's talk a little bit uh, about some cost and comparisons. So uh, Education had, had this nice uh, 100 square foot uh, study and comparison of uh, three systems in that same space, you know, they they evaluated a or the, yeah they evaluated a an AC uh, or line voltage network lighting control systems, and they also 
studied the cost of a POE system implemented by electrical contractors, as well as the POE systems implemented by low voltage contractors. Why the difference? Uh, because uh, POE, the ethernet cable is not high voltage. Uh, you don't necessarily need an electrical contractor to, to install the and source this, this cable. You can technically have you know, an internal IT department handle the installation. You can have a low voltage contractor handle the installation and there may be cost benefits of doing so. Um, I did ask a couple of the local territory representatives in, in Seattle and a couple others in the Pacific Northwest and they haven't seen that uh, practiced very much having a low voltage contractor or an internal IT department do the the cabling and the setup. It's still very traditionally done by electrical contractors, but uh, the possibility exists. Uh, but a couple of good things to note and highlight in cost comparisons. Uh, obviously, when it comes to line voltage systems and architecture, you're going to need your conduit and wire, whereas uh, you know PoE, you'll just need bit more of those ethernet cable spools. Um, another good difference to, to note, obviously, hey, yeah, you know, your your cable procurement for your IT, for your ethernet cable uh, procurement and installation, it's worth to note. But uh, again, the implementation is, is pretty comparable, you know, not that much different in terms of uh, sourcing or a, a, a building with PoE infrastructure. It, it can be very similar to your line voltage infrastructure applications. And if costs are, are ever a, a hard uh, and tough um, barrier to implementing a good power over ethernet project or any network lighting control project in general, uh, I always like to mention the lighting as a service or energy efficiency as a service uh, business model. Um, thinking, you know, upfront costs tend to be a, one of those big obstacles when it comes to implementing these projects. But uh, when, when we're considering this business model of energy efficiency as a service, uh, what it is, it's basically uh, where an implementer will handle all of the upfront costs and implementation and maintenance costs for an owner of, of, a, of a building. Um, so basically this owner, this building will stay very cash flow positive while while a new network lighting control poe lighting system gets installed in its building and then this implementer the way they make their money is by the realized savings uh you know if if, there, if a new poe lighting system is implemented in a space uh where a lot of the lighting strategies can get leverage and we're going to talk about these lighting strategies in a very short moment um but you will realize savings in this building in that energy bill. And that savings, that monthly savings is how you pay the implementer, the lighting as a service business model on a subscription type model. And that's what we call it, hey, Netflix and Lit. Uh, another point of awareness, Seattle City Light has an energy efficiency as a service pilot that started uh, last year, where again, in their, in their base model, uh, as I was describing, a customer is going to realize some savings after implementing a new smart connected lighting system. And the implementer will get their payment from their savings. The customer stays bill neutral, but from those savings, the implementer, that's how will, the implementer will get their payments. Um, some considerations when it comes to poe efficiency and savings um you know there is a power consideration uh on on how you how you measure the, the poe lighting power you know uh you need to understand that it's not necessarily just the fixture or your lighting system fixtures power but uh you need to do the calculation at the power sourcing device itself at the psc switch um, again, as I mentioned before, the, the strong recommendation is to keep your, your cable lengths to 50 meters or shorter. You'll be able to, you'll be able to see a 5% loss uh, or a bit more if you keep getting them longer over 50 meters. Uh, due to the averages in general of, of a job, uh, jobs usually 
average a traditional 3% loss depending on those multiple uh, lengths. Um, and ultimately, hey, you know, you can implement uh, some more stringent network lighting control strategies like task tuning and, and occupancy to ensure that you get those savings. Um, and we're going to talk about this next. We're going to be reviewing your lighting control strategies uh, that you can get with POE lighting. Uh, but before I do so, can we get one more poll here for participation? I want to see, make sure everyone's still awake. Let me pull this out. Um, when you are daisy chaining from picture to pi from fixture to fixture, will you want to use a patch or a crossover cable? So from fixture to fixture, when you're daisy chaining because it's the same device, do you want to use a patch or a crossover cable? Thank you everybody for voting. Give it three more seconds. All right, let me close it over here and share the poll results. Uh, so if we're gonna daisy chain fixture to fixture, if it's the same device, we want to use a crossover cable. Uh, and again, this is harder rule for, for IT equipment than some of the PoE architecture. But if we're talking about IT equipment or the same device, we want to use a crossover cable and we're going to use different uh, types of devices and we want to use a patch cable. Um, I wanted to take a little bit of a moment to see if there's any questions. Uh, I see that there is one. Um, with the low cost of energy in the United States and the Pacific Northwest in general, is a sub subscription model feasible? And, now, and we're talking about this energy efficiency as a service or lighting as a service, and that's a great question. Uh, and forget myself uh, commercially, but I know Residentially, we're looking at uh, nine cents a kilowatt hour here in, in, in Seattle, and yeah, very inexpensive cost of power. But when it co comes to commercial power, you know, different rates will increase that, that uh, cost per kilowatt hour. Um, but even with the low cost of energy, it adds up, specifically when you're considering not just one building, but when you're considering a campus worth of buildings it can be added up and this PoE lighting infrastructure can span well beyond uh, you know, just one building and have the span of, of a campus. So the larger your space is, uh, obviously the, the, the higher cost a project would be and the more that it may make sense to think about some of those lighting as a service models if, if they will help with you know, a larger project in a longer term of a life cycle. So we talked a little bit about the technical terminology uh, and, and components and architecture on power or ethernet devices and systems. Let's talk a little bit about what they can do and when it comes to uh, network lighting control strategies. These are four key strategies that we can achieve with PoE lighting. It's going to be a quick review, just to ensure that we're all on the same page. So with PoE lighting and the controls it can provide us, we can do things like high-end trim or task tuning, which is the act of putting a ceiling at the maximum brightness or lumen output that a fixture can take. Uh, Designers or people that purchase your fixtures usually have a conservative lumen package estimate because they're not—they don't know if they're going to need uh, additional lumens because the the wall and floor and ceiling uh, all got value engineered to darker colors, not not able to reflect as much light, or you know too many obstructions uh, won't let the light level be as bright as it needs. So people that purchase fixtures will usually have that conservative lumen package and you can reduce that brightness with high-end trim. First and foremost, to ensure that there's uh, tenant comfort, reduce glare, and yes, you will deliver uh, 
you will get savings by, by task tuning that maximum brightness of your lights. But ultimately, or, or the more important part of task tuning is to arrive at that comfort level for the task. And the Illuminating Engineering Society or the IES has published um, these recommended practices of what foot candle, what lighting level we should get to for the different tasks uh, available in, in, in building types. Um, occupancy and vacancy, that is the ability of uh, automatically turning on light when it enters the space, as well as turning off that light once that space has no occupants. Um, daylight harvesting. It is the ability of leveraging natural daylight. When you know you understand your IES recommended practice to get to a, a school's desk, uh, 30 foot candles, and your daylight, your windows are providing, you know, are taking you 80% of the way there, then you only need 20% of your electrical lights to get at your recommended light levels. Um, and ultimately scheduling the ability to, to set light to different levels uh, at certain times of day, or you can arrive to that by their astronomical time clocks, you know, sunset or sunrise. Uh, more power to these systems uh, when you combine some of these strategies, such as uh, having scheduling affect occupancy sensor behavior depending on the time of day. Um, and what it looks like when you combine these strategies uh, a little bit, you know, you arrive through a good amount of energy savings, but ultimately you know that you're uh, improving the quality of life for the tenants inside of that building at that point in time. Uh, to provide even more capabilities, you know, you can provide the people in the building with personal control of the lights in above their heads or in their sphere of influence. And you can have additional strategies such as demand response, which, uh, and we'll talk about it in, in more detail in a little bit, but when uh, territory, uh, the utility sees that the buildings and its territory are all using a lot of energy, it can send signals to the buildings and ask, hey, please reduce the level of energy that you're consuming. Uh, and we're actually gonna talk about how POE can, can improve those operations uh, in a little bit. Uh, but first, I wanted to talk a little bit about Luminaire level lighting control. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about what it is and how it relates to power over ethernet lighting. But uh, Luminaire level lighting control devices or LLLC have uh, four characteristics. One, that they're individually addressable. Each fixture can, can uh, respond by itself. Uh, it has integrated occupancy and daylight sensors. It will, the, the fixture that's LLC fixture will be able to dim continuously. So it's not like bi-level switching or anything like that. And it's networkable. Uh, and interestingly enough, that word networkable, similar to POE lighting, does not mean that each fixture is gonna have an IP address. It just means that you can communicate easily to this fixture and device. Uh, as you can see, hey, the benefits listed out for luminar level lighting control, Devices, you know, with less components come, come uh, more savings, you know, less components to install. Uh, you can easily reconfigure the settings. You don't need to get into the ceiling to, to switch wiring and all this good stuff. Uh, good way to think about luminar level lighting control technologies. They are a subset of what we think about your network lighting control. And they have a one-to-one -one relationship, you know, uh, to sensors, to fixtures, you know, one, cent, one set of sensors per fixture. When it comes to your zone-based or non-LLLC lighting control configurations, you have one set of sensors for many fixtures. As a bonus, uh, luminar level lighting control devices automatically meet code. When you're talking about, and I'm looking at, you know, your 2018 Washington uh, State code, although Seattle reads the same way, when you're looking at the lighting control uh, portion of code, it says, you know, hey, you're going to need to install lighting controls, or if you don't want to uh, install your separate zone-based uh, network lighting controls, you can install LLLC controls that are, you know, independently configured, so individually addressable, have that uh, integral occupancy sensor, integral daylight sensor, and they can be easily reconfigured or networkable. Um, POE lighting allows for 
both you know NLC stone based as well as LLLC configurations. And note, I, I use the terminology faux LLLC or not necessarily exactly LLLC. And uh, in a couple of slides, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about why, why faux LLLC. Uh, but hey, you can see with PoE lighting, you know, you can have your, your motion sensors be, be uh, separate than your fixtures uh, and, 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 you know, valid architecture, just like in PoE lighting, you can also have integral occupancy and daylight sensors in fixtures. Um, however, they're not necessarily considered LLLC, and we'll talk about that uh, right after this, but uh, just noting that regardless of the network lighting control uh, system or, or, or uh, platform or communication protocol, regardless of all of that, and, and the idea is to ensure that you can communicate the control strategies correctly to the, to the relevant stakeholders for any project, and the sequence of operations is a document to do that. Uh, so again, thank you for bearing with me on that review of control strategies and sequence of operations. But again, regardless of the protocol standards and communication being used, it's important to note what uh, strategies you can implement with your lighting technology. And hey, ensure that you use uh, good sequence operations or another mechanism that can help communicate how you're going to intend to control a space with lighting. Uh, but I was mentioning, you know, what's, what is that relationship between power over ethernet lighting and luminaire level lighting controls? Are they LLLC? Well, in the strictest definition, it, it may not be. Uh, looking at 2018 Seattle, as well as the Washington State Energy Codes, at the very beginning when they are uh, doing definitions of different components, um, for LLLC devices, it reads in the definition that each luminaire shall have wireless networking capabilities. So by definition of these energy codes, and again, I know that we're not uh, talking with an audience that's specific to Seattle or Washington or even maybe the Pacific Northwest, but uh, I'm using this as an example of where we are located and it may be different in different places, but it is still a very interesting uh, thing to note that LLC, when it comes to Washington and Seattle, is a wireless uh, technology. And even when we're talking about the Design Lights Consortium, the, the DLC, they're a qualifying body that uh, they qualify different products. They tell us that luminaire level lighting uh, control systems must have control persistence. Uh, and that's a, when we were engaging with the DLC, they're telling us because PoE lighting does not have control persistence as they define it, they cannot consider it an LLLC solution. Uh, so what is that control persistence? It is uh, the ability to, to continue to operate um, in a certain degree in the absence of communication with the next higher networked element in the system's topology. So that says, hey, if my fixture loses communication with, uh, be it its hub or its or its uh, gateway or, or main just mesh communication, whatever the case may be, this fixture will still perform and uh, some of the control strategies at a default level. You know, uh, occupant sensor will be enabled and daylight will be there to a default level. Um, so. Hey, with, that, with losing communication to the main system, there will still be some functionality. That's what that control persistence means. And, and it's an interesting conversation because um, PoE lighting only uses the one wire. Uh, whereas network lighting controls traditionally have separate wires for power. And if it's a wired system, you know, a separate wire for data, or, or uh, wireless communication to the overall system because PoE lighting just has this one wire for power and data. Uh, if you remove the wire, it doesn't just remove the communication, it removes the power to the fixture. So that's why when we uh, talk with DLC, they tell us, hey, PoE lighting does not have that control of persistence with the current definition of, uh, of control persistence. If we dig deeper at the QPL level, this is an actual uh, 
DLC, NLC, QPL, you can download, it's an Excel file, and you can filter a search for the systems that are considered POE systems. And uh, here's a, a small view of a couple of these systems that are like, uh, you know, Igor, Molex, manufacturers that have POE solutions. And hey, do they have LLLC technology? They're listed as no. Uh, so that, you know, interesting to call out, interesting to note. And I do believe the conversation is, is ongoing as to how to define uh, these things. Um, however, the real or more important question that I'm going to ask that we ask each other is, uh, be, you know, a lot of talk has been had around prescriptive utility incentives for lumina level lighting control technologies. So, you know, because we're, we're talking about how POE lighting may not technically be LLLC uh, technology, does that mean that should not be incentivized by that prescriptive $50 fixture or $75 fixture utility incentive? Uh, maybe, maybe it can be incentivized and I'll leave you in suspense. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that discussion uh, at, near the end of the presentation, uh, but good good discussion to, to note. Um, however, even if you know POE lighting is not considered LLLC, uh, DLC has uh, made a subsection to their solid state lighting QPL specific to DC and POE lighting. You know, uh, products that do not require that AC line voltage power. And ultimately, they made this uh, subsection uh, for two reasons. One, to you know, catalyze a market transformation, ensuring that these systems get adopted uh, with, you know, if they're qualifying your product, that, that uh, they work with utilities to incentivize such, said product. But the other, the other main reason as to why they, they made the subsection is to allow us to understand this technology as it does get implemented. I uh, want to take a quick moment before we continue uh, to see if there's any questions. Uh, John, you don't see anything on your end, do you? Uh, that is a no. We're good to go. We are going to be care. Got it. Thank you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the POE uh, standards and then how it, they've they've evolved. So over the years, you know, POE uh, has been, uh, you know, quote unquote, a, a, a uh, technology that's been used since the early 2000s, although not thought about being used for lighting. It was traditionally used for this, like voice over IP uh, technology. Uh, it's been undergoing, a, you know, the standard that 802.3 has been going a, a little bit of evolution and it wasn't until uh, Cisco, one of the largest, if not you know, the largest IT infrastructure and equipment uh, company got involved with the POE standard that uh, lighting became technology that could be in play. You know, once Cisco joined the standards development, uh, Cisco developed something called uh, UPOE or universal POE where they decided where in the standard previously, you know, you can only have 30 watts a port. And that's what the, the wattage, uh, the POE wattage that we're talking about represents. It's per port of a switch. So, you know, before Cisco uh, joined the standards effort, each port on a switch had about that 30 watt uh, maximum power. After Cisco joined the standard and worked on it, they, they deciphered a way how to get 60 watts per port through the cable using you know, all of the twisted pairs inside of the ethernet cable. Um, and then later down the road, they developed what's called a UPOE plus or 802.3BT standard where they have a 90 watt per port uh, availability of power for those PSC devices. Um, it's the highest that it's been. And again, uh, so 90 watt per port, but 70 watts delivered to the power device, you know, uh, delivered to the fixture and, and, and so on and so forth. 
uh, there is some, some energy being used by the switch itself and some of those cable connections. So yes, you will see those, uh, the wattage being dropped from the switch to getting to that end powered device. But again, this, this latest standard of the 90 watt availability is what's really allowing what we call that uh, IP convergence and having different device types uh, on, on one platform and not just for communications, but now if you see on the top right for, for power and, and data as well, where in one uh, port connection, you can have fixtures, you can have your, your POE cameras, POE monitors, sensors, wall stations. Uh, so the architecture really now is, is uh, prime for, for solid uh, infrastructure and connected devices. Uh, even then, uh, look at all of these different uh, companies and manufacturers partnering with Cisco uh, specifically to work on PoE lighting. And we see some of the PoE lighting companies, uh, you know, Molex, Newleds, Igor. Uh, we also see some of our network lighting control manufacturers are some of our mainstream, you know, Eaton, now Cooper, Philips, now Signify, uh, Cree. Johnson Controls. So again, uh, the industry is very interested in what this uh, connected POE lighting infrastructure platform can be. Um, just another look at it and showing that, hey, just because you know there's an availability of, of power at the, at the uh, power sourcing equipment doesn't mean that that's the, the power that can get to your devices or your fixtures. You know, the actual delivered wattage is, is what we'll be having to use as, as a, that calculation. Uh, still looking at the uh, DLC, NLC, QPL, if you fi filter you know, the systems that are, are POE lighting, uh, you'll get good information about what level standard they're, they're following and understand, you know, if not necessarily following the latest standard, you know, are there recommendations like, hey, specifies maximum of 328 feet between between uh, an Ethernet switch and node, you know, so good information if you download that QPL and, and, and dig into it a little bit, uh, especially when it comes to POE lighting as it's as the DLC is, is getting more, more data on it on the systems that it uh, oversees. Other standards that are that are good to keep in mind when it comes to the PoE world is uh, UL uh, 2108, with uh, talks about uh, safety for low voltage lighting systems, uh, where including you know class two wires with uh, PoE Ethernet cables, your RG45. These are class two uh, wires. Um, and when it comes to interior lighting. Uh, power calculations or, or for your uh, power density uh, calculation when it comes to meeting code. Uh, PoE, hey, you know, like everything that that's un, uh, under the 2108, uh, sorry, it's 2108, that's, that's a mistype there, should be a 2108 standard. Uh, so, you know, basic, simple calculation, it asks you to, to add all of the, the lighting system uh, power and subtract the power that is not being used for lighting components. And that's how you, you add it to your interior lighting calculations. When it comes to maintenance, there's still a good division or a line division that can be blurred or, or there can be some collaboration, but uh, you know, there's still a separation with what a, uh, you know, IT department may generally maintain. That's still that IT infrastructure and what the facility maintains, you know, but but uh, when it comes to PoE lighting, again, you know, the the equipment and the architecture can still allow for the separation, but sometimes, you know, the, the line can be blurred and, and we're looking to see, uh, you know, who all will be involved in, in, in the process for, for this system, you know, is it the traditional facilities maintenance or, or are we gonna tap the shoulders of different departments when it comes to, to different PoE lighting projects? Uh, you've heard me use the term a couple uh, a little bit before, but uh, hey, I, I, IP convergence again, paving the way for for IoT, and uh, PoE lighting is is a, another great example of it. 
where you know uh, as connected IoT devices grow and as the majority of these use uh, you know Wi-Fi network as their communication platform, we'll be able to to just have that operational efficiency to to combine or aggregate different devices, including lighting, including as you see in IA, be it you know your 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 lighting and your IP other types of devices. Um, into less uh, outlets, wires, cables, and ultimately allow for that efficiency in, in materials used for offices, schools, and other building types. So when we're looking a little bit about that value proposition, um, you know, you can have that potential of uh, reducing the time that it would take or, and, and the cost that it would take to install all of the electrical high voltage uh, power cabling Network cables, they don't really require the, a qualified electricians, you know, so you don't need that electrical contractor to do this labor anyway. And uh, either way, you know, the, the IP convergence ultimately lowers your operational expense. Um, you're not gonna need the infrastructure for different power devices. You know, imagine if you didn't have uh, your, your line voltage outlets in a building because everything is PoE, uh, that could be a, good cost savings right there. But PoE also delivers uh, flexibility and, and access uh, without being tethered you know, to, to electrical outlets and, and line voltage. Devices can be located wherever they're needed. You know, that's the whole idea behind the IP uh, cameras. Security cameras can be mounted anywhere as long as they can be reached with, a, with an ethernet cable. Uh, and and the, they can ultimately be tied to a lighting system as well and communicate to it. So there's there's the beauty in that. Uh, and when it comes to safety, um, you know, PoE is designed to protect your network equipment from overloading the just from the nature of the standard that negotiates the power needs of the power device and the power availability from the PSE. Um, that standard in itself improves the safety of these types of uh, installations. Um, when it comes to reliability, uh, PoE comes from you know, uh, universally compatible sources. You can use UPS devices to ensure that if normal power is lost, you'll have the, at least those UPS devices for 90 minutes where your system can still uh, operate. And it's a very seamless uh, piece of equipment that you'll have in your IDF rooms already. Um, and ultimately that scalability, you have uh, power in the ceiling, connected devices in the ceiling. Um, you know, you can have a very smart building ecosystem. Uh, we're, we're, and, and ultimately, yeah, POE lighting, we talked about the control strategies and you can get some good energy savings because of those, but we'll also have features beyond savings, beyond energy savings that POE lighting can help us do. We're going to talk about them in a little bit. Uh, on the flip side, I did want to touch on some challenges and obstacles that POE is looking at right now. You know, uh, ultimately, you know, you, you hear me talk about the, the 50 meter rules before you start seeing some percentage of voltage drops or energy loss. Uh, ultimately, if you want to go even beyond 100 meters with PoE cabling, uh, you can consider using fiber optic cables. And there's just a couple of considerations because fiber optic, uh, as its name implies, does not have that copper. You cannot have that DC current or DC power conducted over fiber. Uh, but if you use other components, uh, as you see there, such as a, a PoE media converter, alongside a fiber switch, it can provide that power and data standards that PoE lighting can produce. Um, network infrastructure costs can also be you know, a considerable challenge where on average, your 48 port switch can cost about $7,000 and change. And that's for 48 ports thinking each of the 48 ports has you know, about that uh, 90, 100 watt uh, maximum power availability, but you can only deliver 70 watt, 71 watts uh, to the powered devices. So, you know, that, that's really a, your limiting infrastructure cost uh, that you can see as a challenge. Um, 
ultimately high power applications, you know, uh, warehouse industrial spaces or gymnasiums may not still be good applications of PoE lighting at this point. Uh, the current uh, IEEE limitations that we've that we've seen, you know, can have your 960 milliamps and 100 watts, you know, at the port itself. So high powered applications uh, like warehouse or industrial uh, may not necessarily be the best application for PoE lighting. Uh, however, you know, stay tuned for as as the LED fixture. Uh, becomes more efficient or the PoE standard has more power availability, uh, that barrier will be broken sooner rather than later. Uh, and ultimately, you know, I've been asking the question again to, to different market actors and partners, the retrofit market, there's no smoking gun when it comes to PoE and, and retrofit applications. Uh, and, and I call out this, this image by Excess Supply Technologies where like, hey, our, our POE architecture can cost less than fluorescent or LED. But I even highlight, it's like, hey guys, you know, like you, the only way you're able to show this is, is the huge uptick in, in your control scenario. POE is, is a bit more expensive when it comes to this retrofit market applications. But as we discussed, you know, the real value of a POE lighting system outside of, of your control strategies is being that infrastructure for, for connected technologies. And we're gonna highlight some of those uh, in a few slides. Um, but again, you know, the idea is to work with stakeholders that want to deliver uh, that improvement of life for their tenants and not people that are just focused on upfront costs. Um, quick stop before we carry on. I wanted to check in with another question, another poll. Uh, for that 802.3BT or the Cisco's UPOE plus standard, how many maximum watts can be delivered to a powered device? Let me bring up this poll here with the latest standard. So it's not what's the what's the the maximum available power at the switch but what's the maximum available power that can be delivered to a power device to a fixture to a wall station thank you people for voting I think most people got the two answers that i was looking at over halfway i'm gonna wait if like three five more seconds all right thank you everybody for voting and overall we got or the majority did get the correct response that is the latest poe standard that 802.3 bt or cisco's universal poe plus delivers 71 watts to powered devices. So again, thank you for voting. I uh, wanted to do another quick pause to see if there was any questions. Uh, I think we do have one. One or two. Uh, thank you, Marty, for engaging uh, actively. <clears throat> yeah, and, and Armando, um, it, it, it's a little bit of a follow-up A follow to what we were talking about earlier, um, it, it sort of relates to some of the security challenges that are out there. And I'm not sure how much of that you're going to get directly into. So you might be answering some of that later on in, um, in your presentation. But um, maybe you can address. Uh, so I'll, I, uh, I appreciate how the approaching. I, I like it, John. I appreciate it. And and uh, from from looking at the question, we're talking about uh, cybersecurity and PoE lighting. Uh, one of our attendees has a very quick eye, so when I pulled those DLC QPL screens, uh, saw that some of those PoE manufacturers are listed as no under the cybersecurity uh, column for the DLCs NLC QPL, and and you know that's a very real thing. 
uh, the uh, follow up to the question is like, hey, how can we ensure that we keep our, our ear to the ground and, and see when these manufacturers are uh, adhering to some of these cybersecurity standards like UL 2900 or, or, or others? Uh, and for for right now, Marty, uh, what I want to do is I'm going to take your your questions and and I'm we're going to address them offline just because that cybersecurity topic could be a a doozy uh, unto itself. But a great question to ask and great to note that hey, in the DLC's QPL, these POE systems uh, were listed as no for the cybersecurity uh, standard. Um, but again, uh, I'll take your question uh, or I'll I'll have a more detailed answer on it uh, offline via email or anyone that's interested to, to, to know a bit more on POE and cybersecurity, again, feel free to email us at, at, uh, at our LDL address, Gold you'll see at the end again. Um, want to talk a little bit about a couple of uh, system examples and their architecture, how they're different. And also wanted to highlight a couple of uh, vertical markets and how they can benefit specifically by having POE system uh, implemented in their spaces. I uh, wanted to start by calling out a report by the Department of Energy, the Federal Department of Energy in 2017. Uh, they basically took a, a look at the industry as a whole and, and came out with the report uh, with the title you see here top right. And uh, this small dashboard goes over a couple of manufacturers and, and they list you know, what specifics uh, their system architecture does follow. Uh, in the report, uh, they do go over each manufacturer's system in detail and they have uh, good information about them. Uh, note, it is 2017 report that does not take into consideration that latest you know, 90 watt or 71 watt to the power devices. Uh, standard, but uh, again, uh, be on the wait and on the lookout for DOE's next report that will take that standard into consideration. But even without it, a lot of good information uh, for these manufacturer systems. Um, and we're going to talk about three of them, uh, Igor, Molex, and Nulet, specifically because they began as POE platforms, not like other manufacturers that are network lighting control systems that are now uh, employing POE lighting as, as part of their arsenal. Um, but when it comes to these you know, POE manufacturers and when, when it comes to, to implementers, uh, always say, hey, leverage your manufacturer's procedural efficiency. It's not just about the system and the architecture. When, when you're looking at different systems and you're thinking to yourself like, hey, what, which system is going to be the one for my, my, my building type, my space type, or the one for me? Uh, it's not just about the, the actual system architecture, the, the limits, the minimum and maximum uh, you know, connections or power availabilities. It's also about, uh, hey, what do the people bring to the table? Your manufacturers have uh, advantage on global industry knowledge or the ones that are working uh, with Cisco and, 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 and uh, developing their POE lighting systems across the board, you know? Uh, and, and manufacturers need to ensure they have a great relationship and, and communication with their territory representatives. You know, you'll, they'll have that uh, regional know-how and, and ensure local co coordination with projects. Uh, but some manufacturers of NLC systems and POE lighting systems are no, no different. Will have these procedural advantages, like such as you know project development tools and some pre-commissioning services and options. Uh, especially when it comes to some of the POE lighting architecture, uh, pre-packaging a room can have a huge operational efficiencies, you know, and and anything that can help develop a project. Uh, as we as we need to consider, you know, your your 48 ports and and where the wires are going to go, where your IDF rooms are going to be. Uh, so really leverage your sub, the subject matter expertise of the manufacturers that you work with. Uh, start with Molex, uh, became a POE, became a company in 2009. Uh, a little bit to note about their system architecture. They have a remote gateway. So the way they work is they'll, they'll basically have their, their PSC devices, their power sourcing equipment devices, uh, connected via POE cable to what they call their gateway. 
and the Molex system is called the Transcend Gateway. And the Molex systems, each gateway can support about eight to 10 uh, drivers, depending on, on the power requirements and size. So it's a little bit of a distributed architecture where, you know, for each gateway connected to a, a switch's port can connect a couple of uh, fixtures and drivers. Uh, their ancillary components, some of them are, are or the majority of them are wireless, so it's easier on, on installation and location. Uh, and if you see their, their bottom right summarized architecture, it's like, hey, we have our software, our network switch connects to our PoE gateway and ultimately to our PoE light fixtures. Uh, Another uh, system with a slightly different architecture is Igor. Uh, in 2014, they leverage uh, what they call their PoE nodes. And we're, we're gonna look, have a closer look at their PoE node in a little bit. Um, oh yeah, so, so Igor, the way that I, I saw the image is, uh, hey, they highlight all the different cabling, the different type of device that you're gonna need to have when you're, when you're implementing a traditional network lighting control system with your line voltage cable and all of your low voltage cables, so on and so forth. Uh, Igor's just like, hey, we wanna simplify everything and just have that one cable to our nodes and our ancillary devices. Uh, so they really wanna simplify architecture and cabling. So they, they leverage a, a linear node that looks just like a, an LED driver that goes inside the fixture. And they also leverage a square node that's got a very small form factor, like three inches by four inches. Uh, and that can connect to different ancillary devices and fixtures as well. You can daisy chain up to five of these linear or square nodes on, on a port itself. Uh, and here's a closer look at these uh, PoE square and linear nodes. So Igor leverages, again, it looks very closely to a driver. You can connect to the fixtures and it has other connections for be it sensors and wall stations. Uh, here's what the square node looks like. Again, very small form factor with a, a lot of potential connect connections. I want to call out that the diagram on the top right is not by Igor, it's by Hubble. But I, I put it here on purpose just to know, it's like, hey, you know, other manufacturers are also noting some of this architecture uh, technicalities and saying, hey, this could work well for our platform and, and, and they'll have, you know, similar device with similar functionality. Uh, but what I really like about these nodes and the Igor architecture is the fact that they can take analog devices and, and have their analog signals transmitted into digital responses. So even if you have you know, existing uh, ceiling motion sensors, you can connect them to the Igor system if they have the, the correct connections. And you know, the Igor nodes have so many uh, potential connections that you know very universal almost. Uh, and that analog existing sensor can now send signals that the Igor system and, and, and software can understand the signals and actually have you know smart programming uh, to react to these specific signals. And as we saw before, these square nodes also come in UL uh, 924 emergency flavors. Uh, other system, last one that we saw that I said, hey, they, they began as a PoE company. We wanted to talk about them is uh, NULEDs. And you actually saw this, this image earlier as well. Uh, but NULEDs, they have a POE, they call it a multi-node that has gateway and driver. So this node, and it's this is their POE node, similar to how Molex has their POE gateway, this multi-node is it's got a larger uh, form factor. So you know it you have that more of a limiting ceiling space because this, this node, the POE node has a larger form factor. That's what connects to your PSE devices. Uh, each what they call multi-node. Uh, can support, you know, uh, be it fixtures that require, you know, smarts, be it RGBW, your color tuning fixtures. It can support, you know, uh, many uh, fixtures with small enough power drivers. And you can connect your ancillary devices to the multi-node with non-POE 
Cat5 cable as well. So the same cable, but it's not, you know, PoE lighting standard. It's just a cable that's going to get that power and data but to those ancillary devices, but not following that PoE standard. So three different flavors of PoE system architecture, all good viable systems. Uh, they can work in, uh, in different places and spaces. I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of uh, vertical markets, uh, starting with schools. Uh, so schools and, and, and PoE lighting. So talk a little bit about this value proposition for schools. You know, ultimately, PoE lighting can help make uh, schools safer. Why? Uh, with IP convergence, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about how uh, cameras uh, before there, there was they, there were tough to implement in the sense that their locations were hard to reach to with your line voltage uh, cables and wires when. IP or PoE cameras began to be uh, more prevalent. Um, you know, schools started uh, retrofitting security systems and adding cameras with their PoE cable. Uh, so, hey, if, if you can leverage that infrastructure for both PoE lighting as well as, you know, your security system, your cameras, uh, you, you can get to that uh, operational efficiency. You can ultimately improve, you know, students and teachers uh, experience quality of life. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about some of these um, non energy benefits that smart lighting systems provide and, and imagine, you know, if your lighting your POE lighting system can help uh, with attendance, you know, automatically count the students if they're in their seat, you know, these, these uh, smart sensors or your LLC sensors. Uh, can note if the student underneath the fixture is in its seat or not. Uh, also, and, and this is a larger conversation that it could be a class on its own, you know, the behavior and productivity of that student-teacher interaction can be very impacted by PoE lighting or smart lighting in general. Uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see a couple of images from a case study that uh, that the Department of Energy and PNNL, the Pacific Northwest National Laboratories, uh, you can consider them like a DOE's R&D arm in the Pacific Northwest. They did a study on how color tuning impacted productivity and behavior in, in a K through 12 schools. And they outfitted three classrooms with these color tunable lighting system. Uh, and, and some of the findings for the study were Hey, just the ability to dim the lights transitioning from activity to activity. And, you know, when, when we wanted the kids to relax coming back from recess, we'll set the colors to a little warmer. When they wanted them to really focus on their classwork, we, want, we had the light levels cooler. Uh, so all of this, you know, good research around how color tuning and how different light levels affect the behavior of, of, of kids. Uh, so POE lighting is another great way to deliver these technologies uh, to these vertical markets. Um, again, the fact that you can have uh, color tuning on a PoE lighting system, again, and you can combine that with, hey, your security system or other IP-based uh, devices makes it all very streamlined. And, and yes, ultimately, and for all the vertical markets, you can, you can realize energy efficiency and your cost savings. Uh, consider healthcare and hospitals. You know, uh, wireless has become a very mainstream and reliable technology. But for X or Y reasons, some some hospitals will always only use wired architecture. Uh, so PoE can be another great solution for hospitals to get you know into that smart building ecosystem with their lighting. Uh, S same deal, you know, you'll have a lot of different IP devices in, in your patient room. Consider, you know, your, your vitals display or your, your biomedical devices, your machinery, uh, even the, the locks. If they have a central electronic locking system, you know, not everyone can get into every patient's room. Uh, your emergency signs, the charting station, all of these spaces use some type of IP based device power or they could and again just the value of that ip convergence being able to tie to have just the ethernet cable uh 
power your lighting as well as your other machinery it saves a lot on these uh, overhead building costs and can deliver your smart connected lighting infrastructure. Um, a couple other verticals, if you consider, uh, you know, the hotel industry and even retail, uh, both have, you know, the lighting and other types of devices that can be combined in, into this POE infrastructure. Uh, but again, in hospitality, that, that integration of temperature and lighting for, for good comfort is a good key integration to have. Um, you know, the whole, if a guest is coming in the room, you know, let's, let's get those, those temperature set points a little closer, the lighting uh, illuminating uh, about halfway intensity. So it's, so it's nice and, and not too glary when a guest is coming in uh, that same hotel. If, if uh, instead of a guest, if a, if a staff member for, to clean the, the room comes in, you know, these POE lighting systems and integrated systems can recognize that and say, hey, we don't need to have the temperature that close up together. And because someone's gonna be clean, let's make the lights a little brighter so they can actually see the correct, uh, you know, for, co correctly for the task. So these, these connections and integrations are very possible with POE lighting, same as retail, uh, where regardless of what you can combine ultimately in retail, uh, what do you want? Do you wanna increase uh, foot traffic and ultimately have increase in sales? Uh, but again, with, with the, the way that connected lighting can make product more uh, attractive. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, um, Target as a retail store in a case study in a li little bit. So I'll show you the real power that uh, POE lighting and connected lighting can really d deliver uh, a, a space like, like retail. Uh, but, but ultimately it's, it's about this, about right sizing the solution. I was reading an article by, uh, the engineering design network about how uh, hey POE lighting you can you can consider it like a Swiss Army knife. It is a a very versatile platform that combines many different systems, and that's just the nature of itself. But uh, you know sometimes all you need is a good single streamlined solution. You know if, like if if the task at hand is to do screw in a screw you need a screwdriver and it would be a better tool than a swiss army knife that does also have a, a screwdriver uh, so i say all that to say what uh, poe lighting can deliver a lot of benefits a lot of capability a lot of fixture a lot of uh, features but ultimately it's it's about the the stakeholders and you have to have what we consider you know the right postage for the right address Different stakeholders have different things that are important for them when it comes to their connected lighting systems. You know, hey, your, your typical office tenant or your school teacher, they live with the system. Like the system directly affects, uh, POE lighting affects how they go about their day. Um, facility professionals, they leverage, they would leverage a POE lighting system. And so we'll see a little bit, hey, diagnostics and, and energy monitoring. So we'll see, uh, how facility professionals uh, can leverage POE lighting systems. Uh, implementers, obviously, hey, we, they want to make that, that sale and provide their subject matter expertise to, to provide the correct uh, integrated lighting solutions in a correct space. And ultimately, owners, they invest in, in smart building systems to ensure that their, their buildings, their asset is, is uh, growing in the right direction. Uh, before going into these, you know, non-energy benefits that can, we can get from connected lighting and POE lighting, I wanted to stop and have another round to see if there's any more uh, questions. I'm not seeing any more right now. Solid. Uh, thank you. Thank you. But let's talk a little bit about these. Um, non-energy benefits that POE lighting systems can help us get to. Um, as a preamble, you know, we're talking about how, sure, energy savings and code compliance uh, are, are good ways to have your foot in the door with implementing a connected light project. But what's really interesting is, is the emerging technologies that uh, connected lighting systems can help us get to. And uh, again, uh, I think I've said ad, ad nauseum to this point, but POE lighting, that's, that's the beauty of it is 
that platform that can connect multiple systems with multiple capabilities. Um, and even in itself, uh, as as IoT devices are getting smarter, you know, uh, you can you can start leveraging what machine learning is, and and these types of lighting and integrated systems can self optimize and 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 learn how different users use the system, understand preferences, and optimize for comfort and energy savings. Uh, ultimately, PoE lighting systems and their integrations will be a key component when we're talking about distributed energy resource management both inside of the building and with the building as a communication point in itself uh, so without ip convergence you know what what do we have we have smart building systems that uh will be delivered by different implementation partners uh, and they'll have, you know, their own factory shop, their own infrastructure, their own uh, connected smart devices and power requirements. And ultimately, facility professionals, it, it does them a disservice because they're going to have to coordinate with more people, more entities, have, you know, multiple different infrastructures for for services that can be ultimately done by one platform, one system one smart PoE lighting uh, cloud software. So let's look at a couple of these uh, non-energy benefits and, and, and how they can help improve our quality of life. Uh, so when we talk about energy monitoring, control, and diagnostics, we're talking about the ability to um, understand how much energy a lighting system is saving and and sometimes depending on the system uh it can pinpoint what strategy is saving what percentage of light i was like oh occupancy and and daylight harvesting are saving you x amount of 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 energy over x amount of time uh great information to have great that you know the poe lighting platform can connect this device level data and aggregate it all into a beautiful dashboard uh, and also uh, diagnostics where, you know, if a fixture or component is not communicating, you know, systems now can, can send alerts, be it to a, to a dashboard of a connected, of a, of a commissioning tool device or an email. Uh, but again, facility professionals can leverage these systems to know if there's a maintenance ticket that needs to be dealt with. Uh, Space utilization, a very uh, important factor on, on an, a building's space layout. Uh, if you remember from the beginning that a 190 rule, 9% 9 of a building's budget when it comes to its square footage is spent on that space layout. You know, What's the real cost of, of empty space if your multi-purpose rooms, your conference rooms are not being used? Uh, that is important data, number one, to to have, and number two, you can help identify if your space layout has those opportunities for a good solid renovation that can let, uh, if it's an office, office workers maximize the use of their space. If it's if it's a, a school, know what areas could be, you know, hey, this this recreational room can be turned into a different purpose, you know, and, and the cost of that space analysis, be it by an architectural firm or, or, or or an independent study firm uh, is very expensive. And there's also space utilization companies that all they do is, is have you install their camera infrastructure in your space to get you that data. But uh, as a virtue of connected lighting, you know, you already have those smart devices in the ceiling. You have the power in the ceiling from that PoE standard, that one cable and your lighting ceilings, uh, leveraging your, your motion sensors or other types of sensors can also help count the people in a space. Or like you see in the bottom left, the heat map, how people flow through a space. Uh, interesting to note in this image, the, the reddest points are, are the restrooms in, in this office floor and the coldest point are the conference rooms. So that is a space where it's like, hey, you may have, you know, just for the conference rooms alone, opportunities to to make them be more uh, populated during the day. We talked about retail earlier, uh, and this is another example how 
uh, connected lighting can help drive those retail sales or foot traffic. Uh, I want to talk about Acuity partnering uh, with their or with their smart platform Atrius and partnering with Target. Uh, so this is not a this is not a POE lighting application, but the technology, the indoor positioning and wayfinding technology is a technology that's very prevalent in POE. Uh, system. So I just wanted to discuss this specific use case as an example of how the technology can be leveraged. But uh, what what Target and, and did with their connected lighting system uh, is connect their lighting and indoor positioning technology. That that is knowing who is under them and where they are at all times. And they connected this information to their shopping app. Uh, to do one of oh, a couple of things, but two main use cases arose. Uh, consider yourself a shopper just walking in a, a Target. And uh, if you have your shopping list, let's say you have 10 items you're going to shop for, uh, the Target app will pretty much serve as a GPS for like, hey, you need to buy meat, uh, you need to buy lettuce, you need to buy some, some juice. Uh, let's show you a, a nice efficient path. You can navigate to the store and pick up the items that you need. Uh, just because you have the smart sensors in your fixtures and you have, you know, your smartphone is connected to the app, connected to the network of the store. You know, the, the, the store's fixtures can know where you are in the store and the app will be able to show you where to go to pick up your your items uh inversely if you just walk in the store without a shopping list but you get near you know the fruit department or the dairy uh if there are specific uh specials or sales going on as you get closer to these different departments your app will send you those push notifications like hey two for one fruits so uh, again interesting interesting uh a way to leverage you know connected lighting technology uh, asset tracking is the ability for uh, sensors in your light and your fixtures to detect uh, a tag to understand where that acid is or something about a specific acid. A uh, case study that I wanted to call out uh, is from the, um, the Pittsburgh Healthcare Network where they they measured that they spend about a million dollars in in staff's time just looking for uh, wheelchairs, uh, where they estimated also they lost about 25% of their fleet a year. So not only, you know, you're spending a million dollars in, in people's time finding your asset, you're also spending about $70,000 purchasing new wheelchairs every year. So they saw the benefit on tracking their wheelchairs, their assets, and their connected lighting system was able to read the tags on the wheelchairs uh, to you know, greatly reduce the time it took to find the nearest wheelchair, as well as uh, you know, if people were walking out or you know, being rolled out in the wheelchairs, uh, hey, an alert can, can come out and uh, you can collect your acid and not lose the acid. But again, another key non-energy benefit that you can use with connected lighting. Uh, room scheduling, great for, for introverts, has the ability, again, and, and IP convergence stays strong here as well, where uh, consider your conference room with your connected lighting fixtures and your touch screens that can also be powered by PoE uh, technology. And, and this specific touchscreen that can do uh, room scheduling uh, capabilities, hey, no different, can be powered via PoE. Um, but you can consider uh, the service, for example, it's like, hey, uh, you can pull up your phone and if you wanna schedule a meeting, you, you could have the capability to see which meeting rooms are available, which ones are taken. Uh, and even if you know there's three rooms that are not uh, scheduled in any calendar, but there may be people in them, the system can tell you as well because it's monitoring occupancy. Uh, but then it gets fancier. You know, you can you can leverage this room scheduling uh, service such as uh, before your meeting, if you want a temperature and light set up a certain way, if you want the shades or your uh, projector set up a certain way, that can all be pre-dialed in certain settings. Uh, and you can do things such as before, like a minute before it's your turn to go into the meetings, you can have the lights in the room, you know, either flicker or, or lower and raise really quickly to let the people in there know it's like, hey, your time's almost up. 
Uh, so a good amount of communication can happen without you know saying anything to anyone, which is a little uh, scary, but you can get those uh, operational efficiencies uh, from this type of technology. Uh, and you can also pair that with, with wayfinding as well, similar to the retail app. Uh, especially, this works especially wor uh, well in college campuses or large office buildings, like extremely large office buildings where people can usually get lost. And if they have a meeting somewhere, it'd be great to have your lighting system direct to where your meeting is to so make sure you make it on time. Um, when we're talking about horticultural lighting and automation, you know, indoor uh, horticulture, uh, it is seldom uh, the case that lighting is the only thing that you need to automate. Uh, plants require a lot of tender love and care uh, from the correct, you know, uh, spectral distribution uh, to the correct dosage of different uh, lighting wavelengths. Uh, the temperature, humidity, uh, watering, a lot of things in horticulture can be automated. Imagine, you know, having to have all this different device infrastructure, cabling, power infrastructure for different uh, indoor horticultural systems where if PoE can again converge all the different platforms and systems into one main protocol. A lot of efficiencies can be arrived to, uh, not just in, in just automation and communication of different systems, but just in a lot of cost savings for the setup as well. Uh, very important feature when we're talking about uh, demand response which is the ability for the utility to say, hey, a lot of buildings are using a lot of power in my territory. I don't want this to risk a blackout or a brownout. Uh, I'm gonna call the building and have buildings across the board reduce their power. And that's when traditionally, if there was no connected way to do this, facility technicians would just run across the entire building and turning off different HVAC lighting and other types of loads. Uh, connected lighting systems, you can uh, do this very, very easily when it comes to the lighting. Uh, you can do it one of a couple of ways. You can say, hey, if we received over ethernet, if we received a demand response signal, you can just reduce the load of my, my dimmable lighting load by 30% across the board, or you can go to different specific uh, space types and have different levels for those spaces. Uh, depending on safety and, and, and your space types, you know, great way to do this with connected lighting. Um, and, and it goes, and this, this expands, this idea of uh, demand response or, or the greater topic of a distributed energy resource management uh, expands greatly. You know, you can have within a building and uh, connected lighting and, and all these other non-energy benefits uh, can be achieved. And, and this is, you know, just the lighting control portion of your smart building but it doesn't stop there. You know, your building can be one point in, in an entire, you know, city or a larger territory infrastructure. You see a term there, uh, IOB, that's your internet of buildings. You know, you're where instead of a thing being smart, your entire building is smart. Um, a good view of how your non-energy benefits uh, interact with your infrastructure, you know, you'll have your non-energy benefit at what they call the service layer. All of your integrated capabilities are going to be, you know, great seamless applications. Uh, what we want to concern ourselves with are the people that are implementing these lighting systems, you know, is your infrastructure, where are your IDFs, where's your lighting across, you know, your floors and your basement, uh, knowing that, uh, the real calculations is on the back end to have your very nice and seamless features in your front end. Uh, I want to show this table that I was putting together um, where Igor, one of the PoE lighting systems that, that we, we looked at its architecture earlier, how does it compare to the network lighting control non-PoE systems such as Signify, Coopers, Luchons, and Acuities? Uh, took a deep dive on, onto their, their brochures and they have a lot of uh, shared features where it is my, my theory that across time, regardless of it's a PoE system or not, 
the shared features uh, row is ultimately going to expand until they all have their share, almost going to be the same shared features and just a few uh, differentiations across systems as well. Uh, I have what, what I have our last uh, poll for today, guys. I and it's more of an opinion than anything. Uh, so I really appreciate if you if you answer this one. But uh, if you had to pick, what strategy would be most successful in promoting network lighting systems? Uh, if we're and we're talking about you know, would energy savings really promote connected lighting? Would and would uh, would Light, connected lighting serving as an infrastructure for connected technologies be that main promotion point. Like, what do you think will uh, help tell a story or will help uh, let someone understand, hey, connected lighting systems are the way to go? Appreciate those that are voting. Again, it's our last poll. I'm going to close it in about five more seconds. All right, thank you those who have voted. I'll share it a little bit here and I see a hey, pretty pretty even uh, opinions across the board. So I do appreciate that or, but uh, my favorite thing is, hey, uh, the, the answer with the most votes was uh, connected lighting system serve as infrastructure for connected technologies. The fact that uh, savings was third also makes me happy because hey, great thing but that's you know that that should just be the beginning of the conversation at this point <clears throat> and uh i see no more questions and uh this is our last section where i just wanted to highlight a little bit about utility resources and and finishing out that conversation of hey poe is not llc but what does that mean for that 50 dollar a fixture incentive um before we delve into that specific conversation, why do utilities care about connected lighting? Why would a utility care about even incentivizing PoE uh, lighting? Um, ultimately, it helps the utility realize the energy savings they need to ensure that they can deliver that reliable energy across their territory. Uh, utilities want to be very relevant in their relationship with their customers, whether it be technical support or customer support. Uh, that relationship between utilities and their energy customers is very important. They want to be uh, one of those go-to resources when it comes to your energy projects. And ultimately, as we talked about the uh, distributed energy resource management, the idea that, hey, buildings are going to be that smart communicating point in the uh, energy territory infrastructure, uh, well, hey, the more you can connect your smart buildings and your smart uh, houses uh, into the grid, uh, the more that utilities will be able to engage in the energy infrastructure. Uh, almost gonna repeat myself thinking like hey uh, you know utilities can provide a good amount of benefits just working with them on your lighting projects uh, what I then would recommend uh, be it hey uh, I'm, I'm an end user or I have a building that I need a project or I'm an implementer and I implement projects regardless of what side of the spectrum you sit in you need uh, what I want to call and consider a utility whisperer, or someone that's got their ear to the ground and connected with the utility on its operations, uh, and especially when it comes to incentives. Uh, and, and I want to talk a, a little bit about City Light, and, and although a lot of utilities in the Pacific Northwest have uh, you know, similar workbooks and incentive uh, structures, such as, hey, you know, as, as we learn more about connected lighting and POE lighting is no different, you know, there's more prescriptive or, or fixed in incentives and uh, smart fixtures have, have this 50 to $75 fixture bonus. Um, so let's have that conversation uh, because, we, and we saw earlier, POE is not technically an LLLC technology. Does that mean that it's not gonna get that $50 fixture incentive? Not necessarily. 
Uh, but before that's even a possibility, you know, the first thing that needs to happen is you need to engage your utility, regardless of what your utility is, early to under, to discuss the criteria and and uh, if the criteria may match, you know, how to fit that that workbook. Uh, we're talking about strictly city light, and I'm calling out the CNI program. Uh, City Light, in order to, to provide you that $50 of fixture incentives, you need to have a DLC, NLC, QPL system, which we saw that a good amount of uh, POE manufacturers have their systems listed in the QPL. Uh, so that's good, that's a check. You need to be able to program your task tooting or high trim occupancy and daylight harvesting. You need to be able to have two zones, 300 square foot. That's just good sense and it also meets uh, code. Uh, you need to, before you install your project, you need to communicate your sequence of operations. How is this system or how is this building gonna be controlled and share the floor plans. And after the project in, is installed, you need to deliver those as builds and obviously have that site visit. What City Light will not incentivize are T-LEDs as well as fixtures under 20 watts. However, uh, in all of that language, you know, you don't hear the term LLLC. So if you have a POE fixture and a POE project that could meet these requirements and obviously are not TLEDs or under or fixtures under 20 watts, those fixtures can be maybe incentivized with a $50 fixture. But don't take it from me. If it's a question, engage your utility and the sooner the better. Uh, so it's possible. Um, again, utilities, and I see some of the more progressive utilities doing these things, you know, they're putting in their focus on uh, electrification. And I'd be remiss if I didn't congratulate uh, Seattle City Light and the uh, electrification division on getting their transportation electrification strategic investment plans approved yesterday by city council. It's a great win. So utilities are focusing a good amount on electrification focusing on, on decentralizing their, their grid. Uh, you know, how can microgrids enter the conversation for energy? And ultimately, and what POE lighting can really help on is that digitalization, how different smart systems can integrate and communicate in real time. Um, wanted to make you guys aware of a couple of resources and services out there before we close out this beautiful course. Uh, one of them is DOE's Integrated Lighting Campaign. Uh, it's basically a campaign made up of uh, uh, people that have undertaken projects or buildings that have undertaken projects that showcase integrated lighting and supporters, uh, entities such as Lighting Design Lab that deliver education and awareness of these connected and integrated lighting technologies. Uh, great campaign to check out to see how, how people have realized their savings or optimized their strategies. So a great resource to plug into. Uh, Lighting Design Lab wanted to take a little bit of time to our own horn. You know, we're known a little bit for, for our, our education and workshops. They used to be in person. Now we've gone on to, to this webinar format and you guys have interfaced with us uh, so very much this year that uh, we'll be looking to do something similar next year. So thank you again for validating our educational efforts. We developed regional tools and resources, such as a video that highlighted uh, LLLC technology. Um, we also have de developed uh, best practice guides for network lighting controls. And ultimately, we, we still and have always served as uh, Consultants, if you have project, uh, lighting project specific questions and, and we are unable to do physical mockups at this time, so we may be able to do computer based models and, and other types of uh, assistance on your lighting projects. Uh, lastly, if you uh, receive our newsletter or our blast, you recently received a blast about our user, our NLC user experience uh, survey. Uh, we are looking to get to that user acceptance when it comes to wall stations and configuration tools. If you are interested or did not get our, our email about the survey, uh, send us a note. We want to get you on the board. All right, uh, the last uh, last chance for, for questions. Uh, I see one. Uh, and I see one, Marty Hoff, uh, Hoffer. Again, thanks a lot for, for your engagement. Uh, Things more of a, a comment on 
<laughs> when it comes to, hey, why utilities engage with, with your projects? Uh, hey, energy efficiency drives down operating costs for utilities and allow future investments on technologies. Uh, great, great way to talk about it in, in, in the description. Um, but that is the time I have today. Now some words from turning it back to John Wilson. Yeah, thanks so much, Armando. Um, great job. And thank you very much to everybody who stuck with us and joined today. We really appreciate you tuning in. Here's a quick snapshot of upcoming LDL webinars uh, coming at you from our regularly scheduled broadcasting every other Tuesday from 10 to noon. Um, really encourage you. Armando talked a little bit today about uh, the healthcare environment, healthcare facilities. And so uh, in two weeks, Sean Dara, one of our senior lighting specialists, is going to lead a deep dive specific to that vertical market. And, and that's going to be great. So that's the next one coming up. Encourage folks to check that out. And also, I, I want to give a plug as well for folks. You, you probably saw this in your inbox. It came in yesterday at 830 in the morning. So it's going to be like, I don't know, one of the first emails you got Monday morning. Uh, it's the NLC Wall Station Survey. It's educational. It's fun. Uh, some folks have described it as the perfect lunchtime activity. We really want to encourage you to take that. So please look for that email from Lighting Design Lab. Um, the survey takes maybe 20 minutes for most people, um, and, and it's going to be really, really helpful. We really need input from industry partners and professionals, so we encourage you to please check that survey out. Uh, that's going to inform a future webinar we bring to you. So, Armando, why don't you click forward? We'll take them home here. We talked about the upcoming webinars. We told you this is going to be recorded. It's going to be posted to our website for posterity's sake. Um, a link to our website, Armando's information. And I think, folks, what is it? Uh, as Porky Pig says, that's all. Oh, wait, not quite. This webinar, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't highlight LDL's member utilities. So just a quick shout out to uh, Snowpod, Idaho Power, Tacoma Power. Chelan PUD and our friends at the Bonneville Power Administration, they're all chipping in to make these webinars happen and we make them happen for free. And, um, you know, that's some of you. Um, sure, we'd like to see some other utility names on there, but what are you going to do about it? All right, that's all, folks. Thank you all so much. And uh, please do take that survey once you close your browser. It just takes a minute. We'll see you next time.